So money. It's the gas. Grab that cash with both hands and make a stash. So those are the lines from Pink Floyd's song, Money. A song that's probably before your time and maybe a little bit before my time too. But is Pink Floyd so old that his lyrics no longer apply? Are we always going to be able to grab cash with both hands and physically hold it? So today I want to talk to you about the role that money plays in society, the future of money, and hopefully to how the future can include everyone. My name is Helen Wong and I'm an alumni of Northwestern. It's actually been 10 years now. And I'm also an attorney at the FTC, as our MC said. And because I'm a lawyer, I have to start with a disclaimer. Uh, everything I'm saying today represent my views only and do not necessarily represent the views of the FTC. So first, what is money? So according to Wikipedia, which is basically the source of our time, <laughs> money is the exchange of any item or verifiable record for payment of goods and services. And historically, that's what money has done. You exchange something physical for something that you want. And in ancient times, we would use things like precious metals, and we would exchange it because we would be able to exchange something physical and get something that we want in return. As money continued to evolve, we started using things like paper currency that's backed by our US government. But we were still exchanging something physical. But today, we've kind of moved away from that. Think about it. When was the last time you took your paycheck, went to a bank, and then took out all those bills? And let's say you were trying to buy furniture or something. Were you taking stacks of bills with you to go buy it? No. For most of us, our paychecks are directly deposited into our bank account. And if we want to make big purchases, we use these little plastic things called credit cards. And as money continues evolving, we can actually even leave the credit cards behind. So there are many, many forms of digital money today. You can use things like PayPal and Venmo if you want to split the check with your friends at dinner. You can use apps like Coin and Level Up to actually pay for things in the store. And with the advent of Apple Pay and Google Wallet, you can actually just store your entire wallet in your phone. And now we can even move toward a whole new form of currency, like cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. But more on that later. So the Jetsons, remember that futuristic cartoon with Rosie the Robot and Mom and Dad? They predicted that we will be able to buy things with our watches. So I can't do it with this watch, but I think Apple Watch launched about two weeks ago. So maybe the future is already here. We can buy things with our watches, and maybe all I'm waiting for now are those jetpacks. Oh, well, OK. So maybe the future has arrived, and we're already at the jetpack stage. So all joking aside, for the most part, the digitization of money has been very good for us. It is not just more convenient. It is actually cheaper. And it has, provides you much better legal protections than just using cash. It doesn't cost us anything to have our paychecks directly deposited into our bank account. When we want to pay a bill, we don't have to like, convert our cash into money orders and then physically buy a stamp and mail it in. No, we just digitally transfer our money from our online bank account to the utility company or to Banana Republic. And you can just pay your bills that way. And it's actually also safer. If you lose your cash or your wallet gets stolen, there is not much anyone can do about it unless you get very lucky and have very good karma. But with credit cards, they're very well statutorily protected. If your credit card number gets stolen, you aren't liable for any fraudulent transactions. There's a limit to how much you're liable for. If you're applying for a new credit card or any other sort of financial instrument, there is a whole slew of consumer protection laws to ensure that you, as the consumer, know what you're getting into, so that you are able to know what the fees are and what the interest rates are up front. And it's very carefully written so that consumers know what they're getting into. And what is the key to all this? What allows us to be able to access this world of digital money? It's actually something so common and so ordinary, most of us don't even think twice about it anymore. And that's a bank account. Everything else links back to your bank account, if you think about it. Your credit cards link back to it. A lot of these apps link to credit cards, which then link back to your bank account. But for a large number of Americans, that's actually not a reality. They're unable to get a bank account. So according to the FDIC, nearly one in three American households do not have a bank account or do not have regular access to a bank account. This population, known as the unbanked and the underbanked, 
is significant. It's nearly 30%, and they are not able to access all the benefits of digital money that we've been talking about, like Apple Watch. Forget it. So who are these people? How are they able to even participate in day-to-day -day life in society where everything's digitized? And why should we care? So first, um, they, these people are usually the low-income populations. They are probably minorities, and they live paycheck to paycheck. They live very close to the poverty line. And the reason they don't have bank accounts, it's simply they do not have enough money. They might not have enough money to meet the minimum balance. They might not be getting regular paychecks, so they are concerned about overdraft fees. And for some people, they might just live in such rural areas that they physically can't get to a bank to open the first bank account. So what do they do? Well, what they do is they use check cashing services. And it's the scenario that most of us can't even imagine anymore. They physically take their paycheck to one of these check cashing stores and they get cash in return. And to pay bills, they purchase money orders at these places and they pay additional fees so they could pay their bills. And these services are not cheap. It costs between 1.5 to 10% of their check. It doesn't sound like a lot in isolation, but taking together a family making on average $20,000 for this population, they'll be using about $1,200 on check cashing and bill pay fees. So $1,200 for nothing other than the ability to use money that they've already earned. And $1,200 for a family like this could pay utilities for months and months and groceries for months and months. And I know a little bit about how difficult this is. I'm very lucky to be standing here today. I'm a first generation American and I'm the first in my family to go to college. So I know a little bit about what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck, how hard it is when you're spending precious dollars just to use money that you have already worked really hard to earn. And I know a little bit about what it's like to be stuck in the cycle of debt. And obviously, this raises like broader socioeconomic issues that we can't resolve in 15 minutes. But what we can talk about is how we can start helping bring this population into the banking world so they can also experience this digital revolution that the rest of us are experiencing. So mobile phones. It may not seem very related. And you might be asking yourself, how can someone that can't even afford a bank account, how can they afford a mobile phone? And the reason is, in today's 21st century society that we live in, a mobile phone serves as sort of a lifeline. If you can't afford your phone bill, you can't afford regular internet access, and you can't afford a desktop computer, a mobile phone serves as a lifeline as such, so you can access all those services. You can use it for navigation. You can use it to search for health information. And you can even use it to uh, apply for jobs, which studies show this population does a lot. And it's not just anecdotal. Um, study after study has shown that 70% of the under unbanked have access to mobile phones, and 90% of the underbanked have access to mobile phones. So this is something that we can work with. So what do we do? Well, first, we could look at those apps that we were talking about earlier. In addition to uh, Venmo, we can think about things like um, flip money or cash and transfer, just two examples out of dozens and dozens. And these are the types of apps that might not link to a bank account and it might not link to a credit card. So you can use that um, to start paying for services. It links to things like prepaid cards and things like cash. So 7-Eleven, for example, would allow you to load your app with cash. Not ideal, especially with prepaid cards, because there's still a bit of fees associated with prepaid cards. So another example, potential solution, would be cryptocurrencies, which are bitcoins. Um, you have definitely heard about bitcoins, and they are the most popular and most valuable of all cryptocurrencies right now. But it's just one example of hundreds of cryptocurrencies that are out there. And what bitcoin and these cryptocurrencies do is it's a decentralized um, algorithm that issues bitcoins at a certain date, and it allows for peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So that wasn't super articulate, but I'll try to explain what that means. So bitcoins are issued w without any sort of central authority. There is no US government that is focused on deciding when to issue more money into this economy. Bitcoins are already predetermined. The algorithm has already determined how many bitcoins are going to be issued each day into a set date into the future. 
So some people argue that that helps with things like inflation, but that's not for our discussion today. Let's focus on the second part, the peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So right now, if I want to make a transaction to you, I would have to use something like PayPal and, or a bank account. And that third party will oversee our transaction. If I wanted to make a transfer with Bitcoin, I can just transfer my money to you with no third party overseeing it. And that's what it means to have peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So what does this mean, this highly technical algorithm that's really just starting to catch on? How can this help people like the unbanked and the underbanked? And the reason is there are very low barriers to entry. With a bank account, there are still things like minimum balances, maybe credit checks, and they, they still need to worry about the different fees that are involved. With Bitcoins, all you really need to get involved is a virtual wallet. And you can just apply for one. They're virtually free in multiple places online. And you can have multiple virtual wallets the way you would have multiple email addresses. And once you have a virtual wallet, you can start transferring money to anyone, nearly anywhere in the world. So imagine a world where you're getting paid with Bitcoins. Your employer will just transfer Bitcoins from his virtual wallet to your virtual wallet. So you don't need to worry about transaction fees. We're removing the step of having a physical paycheck the way the rest of us already do with a bank account. And if you want to start transferring money to your friends or loved ones abroad, it's as simple as a click. You don't need to worry about high transaction fees. Same thing with paying bills, which is another huge barrier. You can just transfer money from your Bitcoin wallet, your virtual wallet, to ComEd's virtual wallet. And the transaction is seamless, and the transaction fees right now are nearly free. So but, and this is a big but, I don't think we're there yet. Um, you might have noticed, most of us are not getting paid in Bitcoin. And the reason is, it's not widely adopted, because I think consumers don't trust it. There's a lot of theories about why Bitcoin hasn't completely caught on, but I think it all comes down to consumer trust. People can't use something if they're not sure they can, they're protected, if they're not sure that fraudulent transfers won't get reversed. And for Bitcoin right now, that is definitely a problem. If you look at things like chargeback rates that credit cards have, and these are the types of laws that um, I enforce at the FTC, things like Truth in Lending Act and Electronic Fund Transfer Act, these laws don't really apply to transfer um, with Bitcoins. With Bitcoin right now, if there's a transaction um, that was fraudulent, there's not much anyone can do about it. Um, because it's peer-to-peer, -peer, there's no laws forcing the other person to transfer back. Or if your virtual wallet gets hacked, that there's not too much anyone can do about that right now either. And there are also very few disclosure laws surrounding Bitcoin. So with credit cards and other financial instruments, you have to state exactly what you're giving the consumer, what the fees are. And with Bitcoins, that's not completely required. So if you end up on a virtual wallet site that might be misrepresenting or presenting fraudulent terms, the laws aren't as well enforced. And finally, um, Bitcoins are not insured by the US government. So if you're storing your money in a Bitcoin exchange, which is the online version of a bank account, you can't, that money, if that Bitcoin exchange fails, that money is gone. For a bank, if that bank fails, um, the US government will step in and insure your money. You might have heard of Mt. Gox, which was one of the most popular Bitcoin exchanges, and now is one of the most infamous. When it failed a few years ago, it took with it nearly $500 million in um, consumer bitcoins. And that money's gone. It's not insured, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. I know people might disagree. I know you might think that once you start regulating bitcoin, once you start putting in all these consumer protection laws, it won't be effective anymore. Or maybe it'll drive the costs up. And maybe there's an argument for that. But I look at credit cards, which are one of the most statutorily enforced financial instruments out there for consumers. And they're widely adopted. Everyone who can tries to get one to use because they trust it. They don't really have to worry about fraudulent transactions. And yes, costs may go up because right now Bitcoin transfers are nearly free, but I don't think any fees will be as high as the nearly 10% that check cashing companies currently charge. I'm not saying everyone needs to close their bank accounts and start using Bitcoins exclusively. 
But what I am saying is in a world where we're leaving one in three American families behind, where some of us are using Apple watches with even better security features than our traditional credit cards, we have to do something for nearly one in three American households. And Bitcoins may be the solution to that, or maybe we can challenge ourselves to come up with something even better. So technology has been the great equalizer of our time. I mean, the internet's a very obvious example. It has provided all this access to education and entertainment and navigation services, things that we couldn't even imagine 10 or 15 years ago. And I think it's my personal belief that embracing new technologies like Bitcoin could help us lead the next revolution. It could help us use the internet in order to, to level the playing field in a way that matters most to everyone. And that is making a stash of virtual cash. Thank you. Thank you.